Hello, welcome to our latest webinar on our RemQ product. Today we speak about the three ways to immediately save money in procurement. So this will be a short, crisp webinar coming to the point, hopefully uh, helpful to everyone. And here together with me is my colleague, Tomislav. Welcome, Tomislav. Hi, hey, Jens. Glad nice to, to meet you. you. Where are you right now? In Skopje, Macedonia. Awesome. Yeah, Thomas Love, you're with the with the project and uh, the, the product already for several years, five years or so. Thomas Love is running our um, customer success team, uh, working with customers uh, worldwide and in various industries, different sizes, and helping them to improve the internal controls, automate the internal controls, and also to realize real money savings in various exactly. areas. Today we're going exactly. to speak about procurement. Yeah. Awesome. So he's our really subject matter expert for many things. So let's look at uh, what we're going to cover today. Um, what we experience is that the internal control system very often still relies on manual processes or uh, sometimes also called like self assessments. It's like questionnaires. Sometimes they are digital questionnaires, but actually the, the internal control people are asking the business are you, are you having controls in place? And they're not using data analytics, not using real-time data analytics uh, in place to monitor all business processes. But there's a big opportunity there to not only reduce risk on a like abstract level, but uh, to realize real money savings in various areas. Of course, also on the, on the revenue side where you um, recognize revenue, but throughout accounting, materials management, inventory, um, HR and payroll. And today we're going to speak about uh, procurement. Having this automated means you can do real-time checks on all transactions. Um, and um, also um, we have an integrated case management. And what we learned from our customers and even um, independent consultants um, confirm that that makes your life much easier when the external auditor or maybe even the internal audit team comes and asks you for your internal control. So recent Gartner study here that says you can save like maybe 25% of your external audit fees if you automate your internal controls. So let's look at how you can do that. In particular, let's look at a few real life use cases that deliver an immediate return on investment. A little bit more about us, maybe um, Focus Labs. Some of you might know some of our other products. Um, what all the products have in common is that we try to really help saving money. Um, with our license assessment tool, uh, SEMQ, we help you to optimize your SAP licenses. Advisory Queue help you optimize your way to S4HANA and RICE. And here with RAMQ, we're helping to monitor business processes and avoid financial losses through errors, fraud, inefficiencies, waste. This tool has been developed already for almost 10 years, and we have worked together both with auditors and consultants, but a lot of the content that we're going to present also partially today has been developed in co-innovation projects together with our customers. Um, they have experienced that we as a single vendor cannot uh, have because we cannot, we're going to gain and have all this R&D just in a lab. That's too theoretical, but uh, we depend on working with our customers. And that's actually Thomas Love's main job. Uh, he's, uh, he's the connection between the product and real life with our customers. And uh, so it's both for like roll out and helping customers being successful. But for us, that's also a function where we roll in requirements, new ideas, experience and insights that come from a large set of customers. So the tool has been optimized in the last years. Um, usually we can deliver a quick return on investment. And we do this in different areas. Um, everything is focused around trying to prevent financial losses. That's what we call, uh, we follow the money from revenue to the spend side. So we have controls. Uh, built into the tool, and you can add your own controls, of course, but we have a pre-built library from order to cash, revenue to 
procure to pay um, the spend side. And we have an additional module for HR and payroll. Often that's even a different system. So for us, it's a different module. And the, the root of trust in everything you do is with whom you work together. And uh, so your business partners are critical to the success of the, your organization. And that's both vendors and customers. And uh, business partner screening is part of what we offer. It even includes uh, sanctioned screening. So um, today we look at three ways to save money in procurement. And I'm not thinking about optimizing a process or something like that, but we are discussing here uh, something on a more like transactional level, individual documents, data that we find in the system. And the first example is duplicate invoices. Um, Thomas Love, do we have real life experience with duplicate invoices with our customers? Yeah, actually, we just uh, recently had a call with one of our clients and they said that the biggest quick wins, which any client can achieve is actually through the duplicate invoice check. So the immediate return on investment and yeah, they can immediately see the results uh, from just utilizing one of the our checks, which we have them like 100 plus. Right. I think um, whoever is using the product uh, in, in an organization, he also needs to sell the return on investment to management. And I think mm -hmm. the nice thing here is that um, imagine you discover two invoices that are duplicates. You, you do not pay them twice. You only pay them once because you have detected that case. You have immediate savings. And we can even put, obviously, precise numbers behind that because it's the face value of the invoice that you did not pay. That's the amount of money. And that's what usually senior management likes. If you can go and say, look, it's not just a risk tool. It doesn't just monitor some configuration in the system or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. we're discovering business transactions that lose money. And we fix that. And here's the money in the bank account. So helping with the bottom line, actually. Mm -hmm. exactly. There can be different reasons why an invoice was entered twice or maybe even processed twice right i mean fraud is one thing could even include collusion but uh, i guess if you're looking for fraud what we're looking or what we're finding much more often thomas love is errors right you look for fraud you yeah, find yeah. them yeah exactly yeah and then you see that the system is not not is, is prone to error so yeah it's yeah, always errors. good to get something to to back you up Right, and uh, errors can happen on, on, on various sides, right? The vendor can make an error and send an invoice twice for whatever reason. Maybe the first one has not been paid or the first invoice was wrong because sales tax was added in a wrong way or not added or something like that. Um, other, op other ways where errors can happen is, is like uh, in the processing of the incoming invoice, you enter them twice because bad process, I don't know. Um, yeah, fraud is another option. So, but there are already very often preventive measures in place. Um, it still can happen, as you said, right? I mean, uh, you can set up the system and you reduce the chance to have errors, but they still can happen. Um, some of the measures that we think are helpful to prevent duplicate payments is one is, um, establishing a four eyes principle like segregation of duty sod here in the slide for both maintaining vendor master data and for entering invoices but even for invoice entry and invoice approval if you can do that if you have enough people in your procurement department that actually can uh, divide the different uh, process steps mm -hmm. um, i think there's also technical measures from from provided by sap Thomas Love, what, what can you do to customize or have the SAP system to check this? Yeah, actually, SAP by itself, uh, there are certain uh, setup in the system which can be done. So basically, the first thing that is set up is the reference field checked. Then uh, what SAP, in additional customization, which can be done is actually checking the vendor, the currency uh, and the invoice gross amount and the invoice date and based on that uh, it 
it can so ACP has a warning message which can which, which is telling me that actually this invoice might be duplicate to X Y invoice but uh, as I said this is a warning message not an error message so it can lead to a duplication of these invoices so the even the the user which is entering the data might you know unintentionally just uh, ignore the message and post the invoice again and that's why we have this uh, duplicate invoice check which actually checks what has been done in the system or yeah you can mm. further give us yeah, an example i think i think there's two things where we kind of uh, excel compared with the SAP standard thing mm -hmm. one um, for instance, SAP checks whether it's an exact match, like the invoice amounts have to exactly match. My example, um, it, it was on the slide, SAP checks the gross amount. My previous example, if there's an error with sales tax, then the exact amount will not match because the tax is missing on one. So mm -hmm. one is how do you match the data in the two invoices? And the other is that SAP throws a warning but doesn't really block anything, right? Yes, yes. And so I think this is what we're going to see now, that we have this kind of, let's call it fuzzy matching or smart matching of um, of two different invoices that we can correlate. Here is an example, a screenshot from the system. On the right-hand side, we see details of an alert that was created by the system. And you see highlighted that there are two different invoice numbers. So the last mm -hmm. digit is four and five. Let's assume the simple example again. Vendor issues uh, an invoice um, with sales tax, then realizes there was a mistake, but the invoice has already been entered, then issues a second invoice with a different invoice number with without sales tax. So that means the invoice numbers are different, the invoice dates are different maybe, and also the, um, the gross amounts are different. So, but we are still able um, to match that because uh, our check looks for similarity, not for an exact matching. Uh, you can define how similar you want the check to work, how much the confidence level is, for instance. So, mm -hmm. and we do have this fuzzy matching on amounts, on invoice numbers, on vendor names, on vendor numbers, and all this kind of stuff. And so the, the, the higher the matching, um, then you will uh, finally, finally get an alert and you have a chance to look into that. And what the check also can do is, we can also block this document, right? Or yeah, 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 for sure. So there is also auto reaction methods, so-called auto reaction method, which uh, work in our system, when which can actually work uh, in the way that they actually post uh, act, do the blocking uh, indicator on the document level, and in this way uh, the the invoice will be blocked for further processing meaning for payment so payment hmm. yeah uh, in this case the company will not lose the money for duplicate payment of the same invoice yeah so just one example and again here we mentioned two two things to, to memorize so to say it's a fuzzy or a smart matching it's not like this precise matching which is prone to false negatives you don't find the uh, duplicate invoices because something is different and the other is that we can actually block this, set a hard block, not just throw a warning in the SAP GUI when somebody enters something and then clicks on OK because you get so many messages and you don't read them or you, you, you decide to ignore them. So duplicate invoice is definitely something and you have seen on the alert there is an, a euro, dollar, uh, whatever number of the financial risk. If you do a duplicate payment like this, then um, this is money where you can go to management and say, this is exactly the amount um, that we saved with the tool. And here's the return investment on my project. There are other scenarios, payment terms, for instance. Um, I think payment terms is even more complex, right? Because there's different ways how you can, let's say manage, is that right, Thomas Love, payment terms, where you, where you save them and how you, yeah, how yeah. all business processes you use that? Yeah, actually, uh, the data in the ECC environment currently, but I think it's in S4 HANA as well. So basically, the, the payment terms are maintained on two levels, company code level, and then we have it on a purchase organization level. 
and it when when the invoice is posted as a financial document then the, the sap pulls the data from the company code level but when it's posted uh, via logistics invoice verification or via purchase order then uh, it pulls the data from the purchasing organization view so when where the data was stored and that's why we have various checks which can actually compare the data with the master data. I mean, the, the, the invoice can be compared against the purchase order data of the uh, corresponding purchase order. Then we can compare it against the uh, payment terms which were maintained in the mm -hmm. vendor master data. So there are various combinations which can be taken in consideration. But Maybe. in this, yeah. Maybe a good time. I just maybe we have a look in the system how this looks like and what options are available and what kind of uh, controls uh, we have. So I'm going to the SAP system here, and um, I hope everyone can see this uh, SAP GUI. So uh, this is our alert monitor. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the different functional areas that we cover procurement, order to cash, and so on and so forth. On the right hand side, you will see details of an alert. So if we go to procurement, these are some of the checks that we that we ship. Uh, so here's an example where the payment terms in an incoming invoice are different than the payment terms in the vendor master data. Vendor master data, either company code or or purchasing organization, right? And um, yeah. the, the alert displays all the relevant information that you need, let's say, um, but more information is available here also in the system if you just go to the invoice, for instance, here's the invoice number. As you know this, you can drill down, you get all the details of the invoice, you can double click. And what you see here is the, the vendor payment term. It says you get a 3% discount if you pay within 14 days. Mm -hmm. And the incoming invoice, uh, whoever entered that or wrote it in the wrong way on the invoice, doesn't matter, but it says you have to pay immediately. So you don't only lose 3% discount, it's even bad for liquidity. And so if the vendor amount, the, the invoice amount is like uh, in this example, almost 18,000, then uh, the 3%, uh, uh, they come down to a few hundred euro, small example, but definitely money that you can, uh, that you can find and save. Yeah, Jens, let me just add something to this. So we are not just checking whether the payment terms are different. We are we're just, uh, uh, reporting when the data is uh, bad for us as a as a right. um, company yeah. so if the payment terms are in favor then we do not nothing we do not uh, report this but when the payment terms are bad for the company then we report this and the money that can be lost due to this transaction right because if the payment terms are in favor of the user then you don't lose money you even maybe gain money right <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and so you can also see here we have different payment term uh, checks on, on the left hand side and so depending on how your process looks like you might decide that to use one or some of them or maybe all um, that that's up um, and there's many more checks I showed the duplicate invoice check already other nice examples and also high risk area is one time vendor account the CPD account mm -hmm. And uh, we're not just looking at whether there are payments that are above a certain limit. Like usually, I, I guess you would, what Nick Thomas Luffy would say, one thousand dollars or something, right? Some small yeah, amount. Yeah. And we that can depends. Look... Yeah, that depends on the company, from company right. to company, so that they can set up their own limits. Actually, so they're not just like written in stone, and each company can define their their own uh, value at risk limits for which they will uh, we will display the the alerts. Right, but we would even detect if it's small payments. Uh, this is not a small payment, but anyways, uh, even if it's small payments, but if there are multiple payments, right, to the same mm. recipient uh, identified by us. So in that case, the system would say, look, you're again paying the same recipient with a one-time vendor account, which doesn't make sense. Please uh, set up uh, set up a proper vendor and let the vendor also be vetted and uh, verify bank details and all this stuff. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, maybe going back to the um, going back to the uh, presentation. So duplicate invoices was an example and uh, the, the payment terms and the payment terms. We also have checks, I should say, on the revenue side, right? Because there 
if your customers use uh, discounts that they're not supposed to use, that's not a loss just on the on the bottom line, but it's a loss on the top line. It's a it's a revenue loss, right? They pay exactly. less mm. than than they are supposed to 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 pay. So um, yeah, the next thing is, I don't know. We say it's more like now we are more like in the fraud area. Bank changes, maybe right? I mean, so. Our call colleague Paul, he's he's writing some of our blog posts. He found a very interesting case recently. Um, more or less, it's one of these social engineering uh, scams that you have. Uh, they are known as CEO fraud or uh, email fraud. Somebody sends an email into the company, says, "Hi, I'm look, I'm your vendor X Y Z. I have new bank details. Please change them." And then somebody goes and changes the bank details of a vendor and then the payment happens. And then it was uh, uh, a bogus change, let's say, and uh, the money is diverted into some bank account where it should not go. Um, so these things we are looking at, and um, actually the, the logic here is like, uh, we are looking into change documents and, and change protocols within the SAP system and we detect those changes and uh, what we also do and uh, i think that's an important thing that we try to kind of correlate this with an actual payment event right so like like a payment run mm. so you you can monitor all bank detail changes but bank changes are quite normal maybe i mean companies choose to to use another bank account why not but it's in our experience, it's more critical, so to say, or more likely that is kind of a, a bogus change. If this happens in a very short time interval, uh, in particular before there is a, is a payment, uh, in SAP, a, a payment run. So the analytics uh, will, will look for changes that are close to the time and date of a payment run. Um, maybe going back to the screenshot here. Um, so what this says is um, the change was on the same day, uh, zero days <laughs> before the payment run. You can see the dates there, the days and uh, times there also there. And that's definitely something that you want to look into um, to avoid these, uh, these uh, bogus changes. So what we do here is we correlate one critical event with another event. And like that, the significance of the alert is higher. And there's even another good example here on the next slide where it's change of a payment, change of a bank detail, then there's a payment run, and then there's another change or change back or something like that. Mm -hmm. And in this example, even what the system detected here is the user who did the, the change does not exist anymore. So maybe somebody tried to cover up what he was doing. So combining different events into one alert which makes it kind of more unusual even. And um, I think that's also one of the main success factors for our customers um, when they implement such a monitoring and such a data analytics approach. Uh, what I mean is to reduce the false positive rate. So false positive means we create an alert and say, look, something is unusual. Uh, but then somebody looks into it, manually investigates the case, and finally decides that it's it's okay, or you, you want to approve this transaction. And we can reduce the false positive rate by combin combining these different types of critical events, and uh, that reduces the rate. At the same time, in our experience, it does not in increase the false negative rate, so we are not missing real uh, errors and, 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 and fraud cases. So uh, proving the false positive rate is very important for the acceptance of such a tool and program for the users that, that, that use them on a daily basis, um, let's say. And there's different things that we do and partially we have discussed them. Um, it's kind of, uh, you can apply a rule-based analytics in contrast to statistical analytics like um, statistics always is probabilities. And uh, if you use probabilities, then you will definitely have to have false positives. Uh, that, that's kind of the nature of statistics. Yeah. Um, fuzzy matching helps us to have the right view on all the data that is relevant. 
so we have cover more possi possible fraud and error scenarios. And I just mentioned and tried to emphasize the correlation of different events that if there is a change and there is a payment and they're very, very close in time, then it's higher risk than, than uh, at some other occasion. What we also do, maybe Thomas Love, uh, I think it's very important, right? We have canceled and reversed documents and yeah. they would also increase the number of false positives, right? And an invoice that was canceled is never a duplicate invoice. Exactly. And yeah, that was an issue with a lot of our customers because this was causing a huge number of uh, false positive alerts. And then we had to improve the checks and actually exclude those. So now they are already embedded in the tools. So the lesson uh, learned. Yeah. Yeah. So, and finally, what we also have is we have our allow lists, right? You can you can exclude intercompany, technical users, and all this stuff, uh, which means you don't see all this noise that is actually low or no risk uh, alerts because payments within the same group, um, you, you will probably not really lose um, money. It's just left pocket, right pocket. Yeah. Yeah. And let me just give a small point about so exceptions. Uh, recently had an experience when uh, the, our client has a huge number of uh, non existent purchase monetization or so an, 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 um, company which was not active in their case. So they have a list which we just imported into our tool and that's it. Then the check was, was done and everything worked fine. Exclude inactive data yeah. set, inactive vendors this time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very, very important. Yeah. And then also, I mean, uh, I think what's important because you want to be actionable that we can actually block things and we stop that and you have time to investigate. It's not just going on and you do the payment and then you say, okay, that was wrong. We should not have paid, but we can actually do, uh, do a block there. Yeah. So to summarize, I mean, um, what do we have? Um, uh, we have um, we have shown three different ways that that really give tangible, measure, measurable um, results on um, using data analytics in in this example in procurement to um, to save money. So we looked at um, uh, duplicate invoices, duplicate payment payment terms, very important, and, and that's true both on the um, procurement and but also on the sales side. Uh, what's important is that everything is like like almost in real time, because then you really have a chance to avoid the loss and not have to go after the loss and try to recover money. The earlier you can fix a problem, the cheaper and easier it is. The longer you wait, um, the more expensive, and maybe it's not possible to recover many, money anymore. Everything is um, is locked. We have a case management with a full audit trail which helps you also in proving compliance through your external auditors, reducing audit fees. And I believe the three most important areas is revenue assurance, making sure you don't lose, lose money on, on customer because for instance, they, they pay with a discount while they should have paid without discount because that's kind of how the payment terms are. The same on the payroll side, protecting, um, uh, sorry, on the, on the spend side, uh, protecting you from overspending and then the third one, a, a different module here, though payroll usually it is a big, a big factor uh, on your on your expenses. And we have controls there as well, ghost employees, data quality, unusual things, unusual hiring dates or hiring processes. And we also try to go in there and make sure that you always spend uh, money that is justified, but not a cent too much and you don't lose on that. So I think now let's jump into the um, question and answer session. I think uh, uh, we have some questions and answers coming. So yeah. let's, let's look at them. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar. Uh, Jens and Tomislav, thanks for staying in for the Q&A session. 
And I'd say let's jump right over to the questions. I had uh, one coming in, which I thought was pretty straightforward and actually uh, quite a good one. And it says, can this solution be deployed with Focus Labs working with us on a 100% remote basis? Or does anyone need to be, be there and do it physically? No physical nuts and bolts and nothing required. Um, everything is just software, <laughs> remote only. <laughs> so installation is not a problem at all? No, usually customer does it uh, themselves, the SAP basis team. It's just one transport files, one installation file that they need to upload. And that's it. And then we, of course, we, we're going to do some remote sessions, training and uh, helping to, to optimize the tool for their purposes. But uh, yeah, of course, that's remote. Yeah. What would that training include? What, what needs to be sort of done and asked and checked? Maybe that's one for Tomislav. Actually, that is quite straightforward. So we set, we send the transport, then we have a short discussion with the finance team to see which document types company codes are used in the system, set it up, and then via a couple of sessions, remote sessions, we we do the training and that's it. Pretty straightforward, as you say. Uh, I've yeah. got another one here that goes sort of in the same direction, where it's, it's about the usability. Um, is the solution applicable across industry? So are there any capabilities that make it particularly attractive for certain industries or not? Or is it sort of good use for everyone, basically? We do have customers across many different industries, and uh, I think we do not see big, big differences in different uh, industries for for instance, for the processes that we just discussed. It's not just industry. You could also say we manually enter invoices or we have a tool that scans invoices and, and prepares them and helps to process them. Even there, uh, we don't see a difference because basically in the end, all the data is in the same SAP tables where we read the data, do our analytics and report on that. So we are pretty much independent from industry and other technology components that you might have. Brilliant. One, one other one up my sleeve, uh, which uh, which says, uh, is there a possibility to see how RenQ actually works? I suppose this is going in the direction, is there a demo? Is there any type of uh, proof of concept that we can see beforehand before we actually make it happen? <clears throat> yeah, we can we can do a trial or a proof of concept. Um, maybe Thomas Love, you, you have more experience in that area, how customers usually would do that. Yeah, as I mentioned, so it's very straightforward. We, we send the transport, the, the the basis team import the data, and then we can sit and check, select a couple of checks and see how it works. So if it's fine, then we continue forward. Yeah, the, I, mean, I think the software installation is one component, right? So um, we ship the transport, SAP basis team uploads it, so to say, that's it. The other is we work with the audit or the finance team uh, to prepare the the checks and, and run them, and that's something we can do on one day, yeah, together with the uh, with the experts there in your in your organization, and you will have results after after yeah on the same day. If that's already when we made a decision to sort of uh, to take it to implement it, and beforehand, what do you suggest is the best way to get an overview? Is that something where you say you uh you would go for a demo you would go for a poc that actually tries it out where poc is actually connected to using real data but you would go for a demo to actually show what it looks like <clears throat> of course we can always do a demo uh, happy to do that um uh, just let us know when is a good time to to connect um the other thing actually is something that you can do before you have a a, a buying decision you can you can test the tool with your own data uh, maybe using uh, analytics on the data of the last one year or something like that and so you see what kind of um, results you get in your environment it's not something that is abstract and where we show you demo data that is prepared and that looks nice but you never know what happens when the software hits uh, reality so to say but that's something you can really try out um, no risk there and it's it's also very very low effort to implement it for such a trial 
That sounds good. So all the question seems to be going how to start using it and how to see whether it really works. That's how I, I interpret it. Uh, and uh, talking about that, if you have any further questions that are not meant to be here for, for, for everyone, but they're very individual, please feel free to contact Jens or Tomislav directly. They're pretty proactive on uh, LinkedIn as well. So there is a direct connection in the chat. I'm sure both of them are happy to do so. Other than that, send an email to labs at focuslabs.com and we'll distribute it to wherever you are. Uh, we'll distribute it to the right Focus Labs uh, expert in your area, in your region. And then there is quite a bit of material. I think I'm going to share this live where you can um, um, actually, let me just check that, where you can actually see for yourself. So you simply go to a website and you see you have a, um, RemQ has its own section here. You basically go to products and go for more. You have uh, different brochures that go into detail in terms of uh, fraud prevention. If that's your topic, if you're in a in an area uh, where the risk of, of fraud might be quite high, go for here. Otherwise, it's about compliance. Uh, there is a quick assessment guide brochure where you see what it costs, where it actually works. Uh, and there is a view uh, of the product uh, knowledge base, which is pretty uh, 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 full of information that might be in, uh, useful for you in your individual fields. And if that doesn't answer your questions, I don't know what would, but there is a sleeve up arms, which is Jens and Thomas Laugh directly, so feel free to contact them. Any uh, last words from you guys? I'm not, not in terms of last words forever, but for this session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope you, you guys reach out if you're interested to learn more. Uh, let's connect, have a chat to see how this might make sense in your environment. Thanks for your time. Perfect. Thank you Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.